We're going to be talking this month about monitoring for uh, the effects of delayed cerebral ischemia following subarachnoid hemorrhage. I want to thank everybody for joining us and remind you that your controls are available to uh, page through the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. You're welcome to uh, uh, put questions up for me to answer, and uh, we'll save those for the very end of the talk. So tonight we're going to talk about causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage. We're going to review the pertinent elements of cerebral vasospasm, and specifically we're going to focus tonight on the concept of delayed cerebral ischemia. Um, we're going to focus on pathophysiology, surveillance, and treatment, and, and I really try to drill down on this. Uh, there's there's a lot we could talk about with subarachnoid hemorrhage, but for the most part, I think the content tonight is going to focus on uh, flow, cerebral blood flow, and uh, what limits it. So we'll introduce the cerebral uh, blood flow monitor that we're putting out to the market called C-Flow, and we'll describe how the C-Flow can improve delivery of care in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. So by definition, subarachnoid hemorrhage is simply the extravasation of blood into the subarachnoid space, which is the space between the peel and arachnoid membranes. Pretty straightforward. There are numerous causes. Probably the most uh, common cause that we see in the clinical scenario is trauma, followed by aneurysmal rupture, vascular dissection, and then uh, many other causes, such as septic or mycotic pseudoaneurysms. And the ultimate uh, issue that we face with subarachnoid hemorrhage, once the patient's, of course, stabilized and the underlying uh, causes of the hemorrhage have been controlled, is vasospasm. <clears throat> and this is a very complex process, and uh, really we could uh, spend a whole hour talking about the underlying causes here, uh, but ultimately it comes down to the idea of uh, inflammatory mediators and generally the breakdown products of blood that invest themselves into the walls of the arteries and lead to this chronic uh, condition called vasospasm. It turns out that neuronal breakdown products also probably play a role and uh, uh, are present as well and may uh, catalyze some of the vasospastic changes that we see in the uh, cerebral arteries. So what is the issue here with vasospasm? Uh, delayed cerebral ischemia is the present uh, problem that we're going to talk about tonight. And delayed cerebral ischemia is a complex uh, process that is the ultimate result of vasospasm. Now there's a complex interplay here. Vasospasm may lead to delayed cerebral ischemia, uh, but this is not always the case. In fact, uh, the threshold for the degree of vasospasm that is required to lead to DCI is also just not clear. Uh, it turns out that there are areas of uh, the brain that are um, somewhat preferentially affected by vasospasm. Um, so areas of the brain that don't seem to be downstream for vasospasm typically don't seem to encumber the effects of DCI. Um, but uh, the, the flip side of that coin is that vasospasm does not necessarily guarantee DCI. So <clears throat> it's, it's uh, something that we're still working out right now and trying to decide what is the uh, sensitivity and specificity of various uh, different diagnostic modalities. The consequences of vasospasm in terms of delayed cerebral ischemia uh, are stepwise. Uh, so as flow becomes impoverished, um, neuronal changes start to take place, the neurological exam starts to get altered, and encephalopathy is generally the first change that's noted. As uh, flow becomes more and more limited, then ultimately uh, tissue ischemia progresses to infarction. And as you see in this diagram here, a whole vascular bed involving a, a right and middle cerebral artery territory is impoverished to flow, and infarction ultimately uh, takes place. Now, this is what we're really trying to prevent. Delayed cerebral ischemia is one of the more frustrating consequences of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we're uh, working hard to try to figure out how to prevent that. And uh, by identifying vasospasm, we think that we may be able to uh, have opportunity for intervention. Now, vasospasm uh, location is variable, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in traumatic vasospasm, uh, we tend to usually see DCI changes within the region of the most injured brain tissue, and this is very heterogeneous. It really depends on, on the individual patient and how the trauma took place, what parts of the brain are the most injured, and those injured areas tend to be uh, most affected with DCI. With aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's a little bit different. Again, you can see fairly any region involved with DCI uh, due to vasospasm, but it, it's a little bit more um, difficult to predict. You have uh, blood at the base of the brain that is uh, surrounding and investing the great vessels at their origin, and uh, this can lead to vasospasm essentially in any uh, downstream location. 
<clears throat> and vasospasm essentially is a limitation of flow. So going back to the, the physics of this uh, concept of flow itself is important to review and uh, explain some of the things that we do in patients with vasospasm to uh, to prevent them from having delayed cerebral ischemia. So uh, going back to Ohm's law, uh, flow is essentially um, the ratio of the change in pressure over the resistance of the arteries that are involved. Cerebral blood flow is also defined as the cerebral perfusion pressure divided by cerebral vascular resistance, and a variety of different indices can be used to um, uh, to step this out, and depending on how far you want to uh, uh, elucidate the different terms of uh, cardiac output, stroke volume, etc. This is a nice slide to refer back to, but the basic principle is still the same, and that is that a change in pressure across a vessel length divided by the resistance will give you flow. So what is happening in cerebral vasospasm, our denominator is increasing. Resistance goes up as the vessel lumen goes down. So we accomplish uh, some restoration of flow or we preserve flow by increasing pressure. In fact, uh, one of the main tenets of uh, treating uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage related vasospasm is to allow blood pressure uh, to creep up. There are a variety of other strategies as well. I'm sure you're, four of the, uh, you're familiar with these. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much depth for the sophisticated crowd we're talking about here. But I think focusing in on, on the changes that do take place, um, you know, there are a variety of, of uh, modalities that I think are worthy of talking about in this uh, particular instance. And obviously the neurological exam is a key factor for us to follow. Um, now, not all patients, of course, are uh, conscious and um, uh, those patients which are uh, comatose, unfortunately, make it difficult for us to follow a neurological exam reliably. Uh, this is where other diagnostic modalities become uh, useful, and uh, we'll just go through those briefly. And angiography, of course, is considered the gold standard, and this is cerebral catheterization in angiography. Uh, as you know, uh, angiography itself carries its own risks and can even itself lead to infarction. Um, it is somewhat impractical in the sense that uh, it requires a skilled operator and uh, a team of, pay of uh, caregivers to, to uh, shepherd the patient through the procedure. And um, from a certain point of view, <clears throat> even though it's considered the gold standard, uh, doesn't necessarily measure flow as much as it's measuring uh, the angiographic image uh, of a flow. So we'll get into that in a bit here. MRI also is uh, uh, useful for uh, diagnosing uh, infarction and such, but by the time you're, you're actually evidencing infarction on your MRI, you, you're the cat's out of the bag. Um, but it can be useful from the perspective of MR angiography, and CT angiography also has a role to play uh, as a non-invasive modality. <clears throat> if you really dig through the literature, you'll find that the uh, receiver operator characteristic curves for MRI and CT when compared to angiography are fairly reliable. Uh, but they are prone to false negatives uh, and are not as sensitive as angiography. Now, <clears throat> transcranial Doppler, thermal dilution, and laser Doppler are three other modalities that we can talk about. And from a surveillance standpoint, probably lend themselves uh, better to um, monitoring and surveillance. Um, if you think of, of reliable monitors, again, the neurological exam is only as good as the patient is conscious. Um, from uh, the perspective of monitoring and surveillance, angiography really is not uh, a suitable monitor over time. Uh, neither would be MRI or CT. They're stationary. They give us static images over time. So they're uh, essentially not suitable as surveillance monitors. Transcranial Doppler, however, has a, a long and storied history uh, in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it, even just as recently as this month, uh, very well-known group of uh, publishers have uh, placed a, an article into literature talking about the utility of transcranial Doppler and surveillance, as well as transcranial color-coded Doppler uh, for detection of um, cerebral blood flow uh, abnormalities and the setting of delayed cerebral ischemia. Breaking it down, though, from a certain point of view, uh, it can be argued that TCD simply does not measure flow. Even though we're measuring mean flow velocity, uh, flow is in the term, we are really not measuring flow. We're measuring the velocity of blood flow. And there's good evidence and good literature to back up the idea that uh, TCD itself, in terms of measuring flow, is not necessarily reliable. Um, it, uh, the flow and velocity do not necessarily walk hand in hand with each other. They may be divergent. Uh, flow, flow velocity increases during vasospasm when flow may be dropping. So um, there's not necessarily a lockstep uh, between TCD and, frankly, sensitivity and specificity for detecting cerebral vasospasm 
is uh, on the order of around 60 to 70 percent. Likewise, the sensitivity of detecting delayed cerebral ischemia itself uh, is, is about that as well. And so while there, there probably is a role for TCD, and, and clearly we use it routinely in clinical practice, <clears throat> it's not still ideal. And as a monitor, we know that it's certainly not ideal. Uh, it, uh, it's tricky uh, from a technical standpoint uh, to monitor on a continuous basis, very prone to error, and it's very position dependent and technician dependent. However, in terms of detecting uh, flow velocity elevations that are significant, it may open the door to other diagnostic studies that can then um, set the patient up for better intervention and uh, uh, detection of events in that case that can be helpful uh, from the TCT perspective. Thermal dilution is a, a newer um, technology that allows us to detect cerebral blood flow in uh, real terms and absolute terms. Um, it is a uh, validated technology and uh, has utility, uh, there are some downsides. As, as a regional monitor, it's uh, very useful in a territory where you think that there may be compromise of brain blood flow, but it does require craniotomy. So there is certainly uh, a downside there in that uh, it requires a, a surgeon to place. Uh, and uh, there are some other drawbacks technically in terms of uh, calibration times and such that may uh, allow for um, flow changes to take place without being detected. Laser Doppler is a novel uh, technology that, uh, frankly, the, tech, the, the concept's been around for a while, but uh, in and of itself is more recently just getting developed. Um, it does also detect flow, uh, but it is, uh, in and of itself, maybe not the ideal surveillance monitor, <clears throat> seeing as how it is uh, dependent upon laser light. Um, it is um, uh, potentially uh, influenced by superficial light contamination. Uh, placing two laser Doppler probes near each other can lead to crosstalk between them and uh, potentially degrade the signal uh, that you're acquiring. So there are certainly some um, potential downsides to laser Doppler that we'll, uh, we'll address when we talk about C-flow because C-flow is, uh, frankly, in many respects, very similar to laser Doppler. Let's talk briefly, briefly about treatment, um, just to go over this briefly because this does... Um, uh, or pertain to monitoring and surveillance. Uh, classic uh, treatment for cerebral uh, basal spasm and prevention of delayed cerebral ischemia in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage is nabotapine or nematop. Um, uh, classically, this is delivered either through an NG tube or orally, can be given intravenously. Uh, there is a newer extended release uh, version that uh, appears to be hitting the market, or at least is going through clinical trials right now. And uh, it uh, does definitely uh, decrease the risk of uh, progression to vasospasm and delayed cerebral ischemia. It's a reliable uh, uh, intervention. More recently, we've uh, seen literature appearing from 2006 to through 2010 that magnesium sulfate in its, itself is probably just about as efficacious as nemotapine. Uh, very interesting uh, data that uh, would suggest that magnesium sulfate has a uh, vasodilatory property. It is, uh, as some call it nature's calcium, calcium channel blocker. Uh, so from that perspective, it um, has the ability to um, uh, help to maintain vasodilatation. It also probably has some other benefits in terms of reducing uh, spreading cortical depression and uh, making it harder for micro depolarizations and seizures to take place, all of which may have a benefit for the patient. Uh, there is some um, work taking place now looking at combination of nemotapine and magnesium sulfate to uh, uh, exert a, a synergistic effect and maybe uh, help to significantly decrease the risk of DCI. Clazosin 10 uh, in the CONSCIOUS 2 trial was uh, looked at. This is an endothelial and receptor antagonist. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the trial was considered failed um, because the uh, endpoints weren't met, although there was a trend towards improvement in the treatment group versus placebo. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily a dead uh, molecule and may be still investigated further down the road. Now, from an intraarterial standpoint, nematop uh, has been used, and uh, nitroglycerin, uh, cardizem, uh, cardine uh, are all uh, vasoactive agents that have been looked at. Papaverin has as well. And then, frankly, angioplasty also is considered to be a, a viable option in uh, patients where uh, recalcitrant vasospasm is leading to uh, downstream ischemia and infarction. <coughs> Excuse me. I think, though, um, at the end of the day, we're dealing with a conundrum, and that is that uh, with all of the modalities that uh, I described, except for laser Doppler and thermal dilution, flow itself is not measured. Uh, at best, neuroimaging is a surrogate, 
and uh, unfortunately, all clinical trials that have been done in this arena have been done without real-time knowledge of cerebral blood flow. So I think it's, uh, from a certain perspective, uh, hard to judge whether we really have adequately uh, concluded that we've uh, you know, succeeded or failed any uh, clinical trials for delayed, delayed cerebral ischemia when, when we're measuring surrogate markers that may or may not be reliable for detection of cerebral blood flow. And, and that would go, uh, I, would, I would say that goes for the clinical exam as well as a surrogate. So I think this is where we're very excited to be introducing the CFLU to the market and uh, uh, I think pertains to the advances in restoring flow that we're discussing here in terms of uh, DCI. Just to give you a brief background, there are a number of other talks on our site here, um, but uh, cerebral blood flow is monitored with the C-flow through a combination of two different technologies that actually measure microvascular flow at the level of the cerebral cortex. The C-flow uses ultrasound and laser light to accommodate or to accomplish the uh, acousto-optic effect, and this allows us to truly monitor the patient at the bedside in a continuous fashion, non-invasively and in real time. And if you look at other uh, um, modalities that uh, have been used in this arena, you can see that there are many different um, uh, options to choose from, um, but, uh, and you can judge on the clinical exam where you think it fits into the scheme of things, but none of the other modalities truly embody all of the characteristics that make CFLOS unique. Uh, in other words, the continuous nature of it, its portability, its accuracy, the fact that it's non-invasive, uh, technically easy to use, and just overall uh, uh, practical uh, nature of the monitor make uh, the C-flow very well positioned for you to be able to monitor cerebral blood flow on an ongoing basis and surveil your patients for the emergence of uh, DCI. We um, developed this monitor specifically to fill this niche in the market, knowing that um, there was a significant need, a significant unmet need for uh, uh, such a cerebral blood flow. And we're very excited that uh, FDA has approved us for the purpose of uh, brain and muscle uh, blood flow de uh, detection. So as it pertains to the uh, concept of cerebral, uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, cerebral blood flow and subarachnoid hemorrhage, this is just one of the many niches that we're uh, looking at right now. There are many other potential solutions that we think uh, all pertain to cerebral blood flow monitoring. Um, we're investigating the adequacy of IV thrombolysis and uh, the adequacy of flow during mechanical embolectomy. Um, how well do, do uh, shunts maintain cerebral blood flow during carotid endarterectomy? And, and frankly, you can read through the rest of this, this list here on, on your own time, but I would suggest that uh, we have a, an open discussion in the community about uh, clinical trials going further and how are we going to feel comfortable that the results that we're getting are accurately uh, representing reality. And I think that uh, when we go back to the concept that the gold standard today is uh, arteriography or angiography, which is a um, cumbersome, invasive, uh, potentially hazardous test unto itself, um, there certainly is plenty of opportunity for a new gold standard to emerge. And uh, I would just wrap up our brief little talk and uh, suggestion tonight uh, that uh, we reconsider what we're doing in terms of uh, measuring uh, cerebral blood flow and uh, would be very interested in uh, having one-to-one -one conversations with uh, any of you here who would like to learn more. Um, at this point, I'll go ahead and open up the floor for any questions uh, for the uh, folks who have dialed in tonight and see if, uh, if any of you have any particular opinions about uh, or experience about uh, delayed cerebral uh, ischemia in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, so the first question that's coming in tonight is uh, the locality of uh, <clears throat> vasospasm and utility of regional blood flow monitoring. If you uh, look at our other gold standards for cerebral blood flow detection, uh, specifically uh, SPECT scanning, xenon SPECT or xenon CT scanning, um, you're really looking, I think, at uh, global measures of perfusion. And while global measures can be uh, somewhat helpful, again, we don't have a useful practical um, uh, device that will give us a global measurement. The next best uh, option is going to be one that gives us regional flow. And I think uh, I would just uh, go back to a uh, point in my discussion earlier when we were talking about regionality. So if you think about 
basal spasm and DCI uh, and regional effects. Uh, consider your traumatic uh, brain injury patient uh, who comes in with, let's say, frontal uh, uh, contusion and uh, frontal subarachnoid hemorrhage layering along the cortex. This may be the perfect patient to monitor for the delayed effects of cerebral ischemia uh, regionally. And this is what CFLOW allows, our uh, device uh, combining uh, ultrasound and uh, laser light allows us to sample a volume of tissue approximately one milliliter in, in size at the level of the uh, cortex to the very white junction. And this uh, gives you a certain advantage um, since we're not dealing with uh, some of the downsides of laser Doppler such as superficial light contamination. We've got a very specific well-defined area of uh, cerebral blood flow that is um, captured. Uh, this gives you the advantage of uh, making tailored personalized uh, treatment decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. So rather than applying population-based medicine, you're essentially uh, uh, opening up this patient to uh, very tailored, very personalized uh, therapy. And I think the same can be said also for the patient that has a larger, more widespread area of ischemia in the setting of uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Regional flow still can give you an idea downstream from the great vessel origins as to what's going on. And these folks sometimes are very sick, very uh, very ill, they're comatose and intubated. Um, we don't have the benefit of the neurological exam to tell us what's going on. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to have a surveillance device in place to be able to uh, measure cerebral blood flow moment to moment and detect the early changes of uh, DCI and intervene before it's too late. Okay, I'm getting another question here about uh, the acousto-optic effect. This is Anthony wants me to explain what the acoustic-optic effect is. So <clears throat> essentially, uh, it, this is a, the result of a combination of uh, two well-known uh, technologies, uh, ultrasound and uh, near-infrared laser light. Normally, we can measure uh, uh, flow through the blood vessels of the brain with transcranial Doppler, um, and we're really measuring velocity, as I me mentioned before. We're using the very same kind of uh, Doppler technology, but in this case, we're using it to knock photons out of phase, effectively tagging them. And we call this ultrasound tagged light, or UTL for short. The ultrasound tagged light allows us to survey a particular volume of brain tissue and uh, detect um, flow changes through that individual milliliter of, uh, of brain tissue, which is at right around the level of the cortex. This is microvascular turgid flow, so you're not looking at large vessel uh, velocity or volumes. And uh, we think this is the uh, you know brain tissue that's the most vulnerable. In border zone and watershed areas, this is the first uh, part of uh, brain tissue to be hypoperfused and uh, is the most vulnerable to extended periods of hypoperfusion. So as a canary in the coal mine, this uh, region of brain tissue is particularly effective, we believe, for flow monitoring. And uh, feel free to direct yourself to our website. We have a variety of other talks. Uh, we just completed our uh, second annual ORNIM um, presentation and uh, uh, session of uh, symposium talks at the Neurocritical Care Society meeting in Seattle. Very proud to have uh, three excellent speakers present for us and uh, Dr. Smith at the helm leading the charge. Uh, suggest that uh, you take a look at those. They should be posted on our website soon. And uh, you'll have uh, quite a bit of resources there to, uh, to learn more. And so we'll go ahead and wrap up tonight. I wanted to thank everybody very much for uh, uh, attending. And uh, we'll be posting this in the next uh, 24 hours for your uh, repeat listening. Uh, thank you very much. And have a great night.